When dividing up founder shares between co-founders, the big question is, how many shares should go to each founder? In today's video, we'll talk about some ideas to think about as you make that decision. Hi, I'm Steve Morris, and I use this Startup SOS channel to provide practical how-to advice for new entrepreneurs who are building a growth company and plan to use investor funding. So of course, the whole idea with founder equity is that you are contributing value. You're, you're helping make the company valuable and you're taking a risk of being on a, a founding team. So you get some ownership in the company as your way of, of benefiting from that value that you're creating. But the question is how much ownership goes to each person. If it's two people, is it a 50-50 split? If it's three people, is it a one-third, one-third, one-third split? Well, maybe, maybe not, but it's an interesting process to figure out what the right answer is. But consider some of the complicating factors. One complicating factor is, well, what's the role that a person is playing? Clearly, there are a variety of important roles that you might be playing in an early stage startup. Now, to make it more complicated, of course, the role can change over time. So that's something you have to keep in mind. There's the visionary, maybe the, the business visionary or a technology visionary who has the core concept behind the startup. Uh, there might be the evangelist and communicator who can really communicate outwardly the vision. Sometimes that's the same person as the visionary. Sometimes it's somebody else who has more of a communication skill set. Then, of course, there's R&D, the uh, research and development, the ability to actually create the product. Clearly, that's critical. You don't have a company. Uh, certainly, if it's a product company, you won't have a company unless you can create the product. There are other really important skill sets like team management and in general process management, people who help get things done. Clearly, you have to get things done in order to create value in the company. And if you're funding the company with investor capital, clearly fundraising is an important role and an important skill set to have to, again, help create value in the company. So those are just a few of the potential roles that need to be played by someone. Beyond the role they're playing, of course, there's a question of what is it they're bringing to the company uh, in terms of background in general, like educational background, the experience they have, the network that they've developed that they're bringing to the company, the intellectual property uh, that they have uh, that they're going to commit to the company, and that the property, intellectual property, they'll develop over time, which will be owned by the company. So those are just a few of the things that a person can bring with them into the company that certainly can have an effect on how well they'll be able to create value for the company. Now, there's one other factor you have to take into account when it comes to deciding how much equity for each founder. And that's the same question you have to ask no matter what your compensation structure is, whether it's cash or equity or some combination of the two. What is sort of the market expectation uh, for compensation? What's it literally going to take to to close that person, to convince them to join the company? Uh, just like a person at a larger company might be looking for some minimum uh, salary that would be typical for, for this role in a company, a person can be looking for some minimal ownership, which they think, based on their experience and talking to other folk, would be typical of what one would get for joining a company. So that's another piece to think about is what are the expectations of the different founders based hopefully uh, somewhat on what's happening out there in the startup market in terms of equity compensation. What are the approaches that you can take to figuring out what's the right amount of equity for each founder? Well, one approach I would suggest is that it's almost certainly going to be a dynamic process. Figuring out ownership isn't something that you just do once and it's static and it never changes. There are all kinds of reasons that we'll talk about, many of them, as to why maybe somebody ends up not getting as many shares as originally had been decided because for whatever reason they didn't contribute the way they were expected to. On the other hand, maybe they end up getting more shares because in fact they're contributing even more value than it was originally expected they would uh, would contribute. Maybe their role changes and they're adding more value or maybe uh, you underestimated the value of their capabilities uh, that they brought to the company and they're really uh, contributing a lot more. So. It is definitely a dynamic process. Uh, simply deciding on ownership upfront and leaving it fixed over time, regardless of what happens, 
is probably not a good idea. So whatever you do, I would suggest it's certainly dynamic. There are a couple of basic approaches I've seen used in dividing up ownership in the company amongst founders. The first I'll call the negotiation approach, where you sit down with a group and you have the discussion. You talk about all those different factors we talked about, role and, and what each person's bringing to the company, what you expect them to contribute, and come up with something that the team thinks is fair. Another approach, a very different approach, is the slicing pie approach. Now, this is the one that is proposed by Mike Moyer and described in a number of books that he's written. Uh, there are links to some of those in the notes. And that approach basically focuses more on the risk that each founder is taking and essentially how much salary they are uh, leaving behind that they could have gotten had they worked at a bigger company. So different approach. Let's talk about the negotiation approach first. In the negotiation approach, which again, I think is, is the most commonly used approach. Basically, you sit down with a team and you talk about it. You talk about all of the different roles. You talk about everything that each person is bringing uh, to the company. You talk about you know who who maybe one person had the original idea and brought the rest of the team together. All the different factors that one has to take into account. And you talk about how yeah it is complicated. There are a lot of things to think about, but you keep discussing it. You keep keep talking about it until you reach something that people agree is fair. And by the way, the assumption that typically is made in having this discussion is that things go well. People are going to be successful in their role. Now, you have to take contingencies into account. What happens if things don't go well? Or what happens if things go well, better than you expected? Uh, but a good place to start is just to assume that everybody's going to be successful, everybody's going to stay at the company, and you come up with an arrangement that everybody agrees is fair. And fairness here, I think, is really an important concept. If you start out your startup experience with some co-founders thinking that the way stock, the way ownership was divided up was not fair, this is not a good way to get started. So you really want to take the time to talk about it to make sure that you get to a point where the team thinks you have a fair and equitable arrangement in terms of company ownership. Now, a couple of suggestions and things to avoid. Uh, if it's two co-founders, should it be a 50-50 split? I really would suggest not, simply because you need a tiebreaker. You need somebody that owns a little more than 50% and, and somebody with less than 50%. Otherwise, you can get hamstrung in, in making decisions, and that's not a good thing. So I would, I would argue that 50-50 is probably a good thing to stay away from. If there are three people, three co-founders, does that mean it's a one-third, one-third, one-third split? Well, again, not necessarily. I mean, on the one hand, if three people came up with an idea, three people have sort of similar skill sets, or at least you believe they'll have comparable value add, well, okay, then maybe one-third, one-third, one-third makes sense. Uh, but on the other hand, if this was one person's idea, they did some of the initial legwork and, and maybe customer discovery, and then brought in a couple more people and, and sort of persuaded them to join in uh, on the venture, well, you know, maybe that person who was the original evangelist who had the idea gets a little more than one third. That's certainly not unreasonable. But again, the idea is to talk about it until you get to a point where everybody agrees it's a fair and equitable arrangement. Having done that, though, then it's important to consider the contingencies. And this is where we get into the dynamic nature of share ownership. What if things don't go well or on the flip side, what if things go a lot better than you expected and, and somebody really uh, overperforms? Well, there are ways to take those contingencies into account. So let's run down a, a typical list of contingencies. Suppose one founder puts in more money than the rest of them. You know, typically what co-founders do early on in a company is write a check to purchase their shares, but it's very early on and the shares are worth very little, so the check is, is very small. But suppose one of your co-founders has the ability to write a bigger check uh, to go above and beyond what's required to purchase their shares. So that's providing some operating capital for the, uh, the company very early on. Well, on the one hand, the team certainly could talk about it and decide you know, how much additional stock or ownership that person might get for their, uh, their money. And again, as before, 
come up with what seems like uh, a fair arrangement. Another approach, and, and one I think I actually would uh, would recommend, is to look at that additional funding as a separate thing. Uh, on the one hand, there are founder shares that reflect the value that you expect this person to create in, in developing value for the company. And then there's the additional money that they're putting in. And those additional funds, they're basically acting like an investor. So one option is to treat those funds as an investment. You could perhaps structure that additional money as a safe, a simple agreement for future equity or a convertible note and literally have it then be structured as an investment in the company. That way, down the road, when there is a priced round uh, that will convert either the note or the safe into stock, uh, that stock will likely convert into some sort of preferred shares, whatever has been negotiated down the road by the investors that negotiate the priced round. So that way you sort of divvy up um, the question of how much uh, should this founder get for what they're going to bring to the company in terms of capability and, and the role that they're playing versus how much should they get for the money they're putting in. Treat the money like an investment and treat the everything else they're bringing uh, the same as, as you treat everybody else's contribution in terms of their role, their skills, their background, and so forth. So there's a couple of different ways to think about the money, additional money that a founder is putting into the company. What if you have a part-time founder, uh, maybe some founders that are working full-time, often in a startup it's more than full-time, but others who maybe have to retain a day job so they're just working part-time. Well, that's something, of course, that can be taken into account in the upfront discussion when you're div divvying up your, uh, your shares, the ownership in the company. If you know upfront somebody's not going to be able to commit full-time, you, you include that in the discussion. They'll have fewer hours. Okay, they'll get fewer shares than they would have otherwise. You know, presumably a, a common scenario is that later when there's some investment and the company can pay salaries, then later maybe this person would be full time. Uh, but again, that's a maybe. So you, uh, you take that into account up front. You make some assumptions about when they'll go full time. You agree as a team on what ownership that's worth. What if a founder commits to be full-time but then actually ends up being part-time. Well, I would suggest that one of the things that needs to be in the share purchase agreement is something to deal with that contingency. If somebody committed to be full-time and then decides, well, no, they can't be full-time, they have to go uh, get, uh, uh, say, a job to, to earn some money and, and ratchet back to part-time, and yet everybody else is working full-time, well, okay, that's that's not fair. So there needs to be something written into your share purchase agreement that takes that contingency into account and allows the opportunity to renegotiate their share ownership based on that kind of a change. What happens if a founder leaves the company on their own choosing earlier than say four or five or six years? Well, that's a scenario where it's not fair for them to walk away with a big ownership in the company if they're not going to be there to help create value in that ownership. So that's where some sort of vesting arrangement uh, becomes important. A typical vesting approach for a startup would be a declining buyback right. We talked about that in our founder equity compensation video. You might check that out. And the idea is that well, you, you pick a time period, four years would be typical, but it could be less, it could be more and you have the shares of vest over that period of time, meaning that if they leave in, in this example in less than four years, they don't get to keep all of their stock. Now, how much do they not get to keep? There are all kinds of possible arrangements. You could have a one year cliff, which is to say if they leave in less than a year, maybe they get nothing, but it doesn't have to be a, a cliff at all. It, it could be a four year vesting, one forty eighth of it each month over 48 months. So whenever they leave, well, they're gonna forfeit what they hadn't earned, but however month, many months they've been there, they get to keep that fraction of, uh, of their stock. There are even situations sometimes where if somebody's bringing in a lot of ideas or maybe some, some computer code, I mean, some really concrete value, significant value in the company, maybe some of their stock vests right up front. Probably not a lot of it, but you know, maybe five or, or 10% vests right at the beginning. So even if they left shortly after that, they would get a small amount of stock, but the rest of it would vest over time. So again, there are a lot of different arrangements you can do 
uh, your, your imagination is the only limit in the way stock vests. But keep in mind, the whole idea investing is you want to encourage people to stay the full, again, typically at least four years for their stock to vest. So that's the goal investing is to motivate people to actually stick around and help create value in the company. So what happens if a founder just isn't working out? They're not a fit. Uh, and sometimes that can be because they're just in the wrong role. Um, other times it can be something more fundamental, like they're just uh, causing problems and, and they're not somebody you want to keep at the company. Well, if it's the wrong role, then there's always the possibility of exploring a new role. And that then is a reasonable time to have that discussion, which again needs to be written into your shareholder agreement that it's reasonable to renegotiate the amount of share ownership that they get if that role is is contributing less value and creating value in the company. So it's a negotiation, but it's a required ne negotiation that's written into your legal agreement. On the other hand, if it's somebody who's just causing problems or, or just clearly is not a good fit for a startup, then the, the CEO has the not fun job of firing that person. And in that case, that's where the, the actual vesting of your stock comes in. Uh, they only get to keep the stock that has vested up to the point where they leave the company. Of course, another unfortunate scenario that's good to think through is the situation of what happens if a founder dies. Now, that's probably something that is taken into account in the shareholder purchase boilerplate that your attorney will have. Uh, and it's an important thing to think through. Do you want the shares to go to that person's estate based on what had vested up to that point in time? Or do you want to accelerate part of the vesting? Or just in general, what, what do you want to have happen? Uh, you get to choose, but it's an important decision to make and an important thing to put into the share purchase agreement. What about some more positive contingencies? Like let's say a founder does outstandingly well, uh, gets promoted, ends up being in uh, much more responsible roles and is really contributing a lot more value than was originally envisioned uh, when you originally uh, divided up the ownership in the company. Well, in that case, it's always possible for the board of directors to allocate more stock to that person, uh, either provide them the opportunity to purchase more stock or uh, to provide them with stock options, uh, which in a lot of ways is a nicer approach because they don't have to write a check for it and it doesn't create typically a, a taxable event until later when they actually execute the option. So there are certainly ways to sweeten the deal to actually provide more shares to somebody if they really are excelling above and beyond uh, the level of contribution that they were originally expected to make. Another upside scenario is what if there's a change in control because the company gets purchased? So suddenly your shares you know, become worth some money. Well, what do you want to have happen then? Suppose uh, your founder shares haven't fully vested. Uh, let's say it's three down, years down the road and it's a four year vest and the company gets bought. Well, it's not uncommon to say what will happen is the founder's shares will all vest uh, before the deal is consummated, uh, such that everybody gets all of their shares uh, converted either to shares in the purchasing company or converted to money, however the, uh, the purchase deal works. Again, something you get to think through and decide how would you like to have that work. So even when you use, again, what I'm calling the negotiation approach, uh, it absolutely can be, and I would argue should be, a dynamic kind of arrangement. How much stock or how much ownership each founder gets ultimately is going to depend on what happens in the future. Now, another very different approach toward figuring out how much stock each founder gets is the slicing pie approach. Now, I would encourage you to check out the books that describe it in more detail because I'm just gonna barely touch on the outlines of it here. But the basic idea is that the slicing pie approach focuses more on the risk that each founder is taking uh, as opposed to looking directly at the value that they maybe have the potential to create. It's, it's looking at the risk they're taking and specifically the risk they're taking in not getting the salary that they could have gotten at a bigger, more established company that would pay market rates. So that amount of money gets translated into an hourly rate and that hourly rate times the time that they put in is the thing that correlates with how much stock they're going to get. Now, actually it's 
2x times that hourly rate to reflect the additional risk that they're taking. And that's kind of an arbitrary number, but that's the way the system is set up. But, but basically, however you get to the rate, it's the hourly rate times the number of hours for each of the co-founders that determines how much stock they earn over time. So everybody, of course, could have a different rate uh, and everybody could potentially put in a different number of hours. So you have to do the multiplication uh, in order to figure out over time how much stock each person gets. Now, there's additional complexity if somebody puts in cash uh, or if somebody uh, puts in uh, things that they pay for on the company's behalf. But let's stick for this discussion just to the simple scenario where we're just looking at the, the founder's time that they're putting in. Uh, and in that case, it's the rate times the time. If I have uh, a rate that's half somebody else's rate, but I put in twice as much time as they do, then I'm earning exactly the same ownership rate in the company as that other person. There are a number of advantages to the slicing pie approach. First of all, it's very precise. You can calculate exactly how much ownership each person is earning every day based on how many hours they spent and what their particular rate is. It's very objective, right? You, you measure the hours that they put in, you agree upon what rate they, they could have earned uh, in the outside world and take that as an hourly rate times two. Uh, that's what determines the amount of stock. It's very, very objective. There's a clear audit trail based on hours worked as to exactly how many shares they're earning or how much percent ownership they're earning. You can look and explain uh, through the audit trail exactly why each person is getting the amount of stock that, uh, that they're getting. Now, the one thing that concerns me a little bit about the slicing a pie approach is that the whole assumption here is that my ownership correlates with the hourly rate I'm worth times the hours I spend. And the rate that I'm worth, it depends on what I would be paid at a larger, more established company that pays market rates. Well, what I can contribute at a larger established company that's paying market rates and probably has a more structured environment, probably I'd be wearing fewer hats. Okay, that's a very different situation than a startup. And to assume that the hourly rate I can work at a big company reflects the value I'm going to be able to add at a startup, that's a little bit of a leap. Because there are certainly people who can excel in a larger company, get paid a lot of money for it, uh, who, who fail miserably uh, at a startup because it's just maybe too unstructured of an environment. So I'm a little uncomfortable saying that this hourly rate that I could earn at a bigger company that pays market rates is somehow reflecting the value that I'm going to create for a startup. It might not be. And ironically, this is independent of the role that I'm playing at the startup, right? So maybe I'm in the wrong role, I get put into a different role that maybe arguably is adding less value, but my stock ownership, my share ownership is based on that outside rate and on the hours, not on the role, not on what I'm contributing in the startup. So, so again, this correlation of value at a bigger company being equal to value at a smaller company, I think just doesn't always work. On the other hand, there are some huge advantages in slicing pie in that it is very objective, it's very precise in its calculation. Um, there's a question of what that precision is measuring, but it is very precise and it's a very clear audit trail. So if you like the idea of having an arrangement that is just very mathematical, you can calculate out to multiple digits of precision, you can defend exactly how much stock everybody has. And as long as everybody buys into that being a fair process, that their outside hourly rate at a bigger company times their hours is a fair representation regardless of the role that they're playing, a fair representation of their value add, then that can certainly be a viable way to do it. So I hope that helped you think about some of the factors you need to consider in coming up with an equity split uh, for your co-founders. And you have a couple of different ideas now in approaches that you can take to figuring that out. If this was helpful, please click the like button and share it with other entrepreneurs, leave a comment. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please do that and click that notification bell because there's more coming up in this series on the startup team. And of course, we're putting all of that into a playlist. There's a link to that playlist right here. And that is a wrap for this time. Thank you very much.
for watching.